Any questions, anybody? What does the teaching say about, about assisted death? Assisted death. Um, gosh. Do you want to be more specific? Well, there's the, uh, the assisted death for terminally ill patients who are suffering. And then there could be assisted death for someone who will feel at an age where they have decided that they're done. Yeah. And there's no, it's not that there's not much to live for or live with, it's just and they feel they have come to a point where it's been a good ride and they've understood as much as they can and they're at peace. I don't know a teaching of any type in any tradition that I would be able to use in relation to your question. My experience in our tradition is to find uh, some center, like Sonia was talking about, some place of wisdom within myself. It's important to, for me in my life to have really trusted people that I can talk to who can help me answer my own questions to investigate thoroughly my feelings and my thoughts and the feelings and the thoughts of those around me so that I can become clearer about my situation, relationship, and function. The question for me in any sort of situation like that is n n not so much what might a teaching be as how do I stay alive in that particular situation. I don't want to touch that question very strongly because you're because without many details. But uh, what I will say is investigate your wisdom and use everybody around you to help you to do that. Yeah, maybe if you want to say more in an interview, we could talk about it more. Yeah. I am uh, a therapist, kind of on the side of my my general work, and uh, I I notice people's opinions about themselves and their thinking about themselves tends to be an enormous obstacle in their life. My question is what you might suggest for a person who doesn't have a Zen practice, where they may not be approaching a practice anytime soon, and you find that they have this very negative self-concept of themselves and correspondingly low self-worth and correspondingly difficult relationships and corresponding reactivity, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I, you know, in my life, um, in my professional life, I'm a coach, personal and executive coach. And the, the work that I do is based on my training as a therapist, though I'm not a therapist. Um, the, the orientation that I was trained in is Rogerian. You know, Carl Rogers was done down by the professional establishment a lot. I don't know if you know much about him but he was writing about therapy in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And he said that for uh, a relationship to be growth enhancing, three conditions needed to be provided. One is unconditional positive regard. No matter how you behave or what you say, I regard the root of you positively doesn't mean I have to like everything you say or do, but you, as you, your fundamental self, I regard you positively. I believe in you. Uh, two is um, empathy. I'm able to hear you and uh, from your own frame of reference, right? Not, not hear you and compare it to my life and then feed you, give you feedback according to my experience, but to hear you from within your own frame of reference and to reflect back and let you know that I truly hear you and empathize with you and feel, feel with you, right? And then uh, th uh, third is uh, congruence. How I behave and how I act and think are in line with each other. And you can see that. So you can see that the unconditional positive regard and empathy that I'm giving you are real. Yeah. So <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, Carl Rogers said that those three conditions are necessary and sufficient, like no expertise beyond that is required. Right, now I'm not saying that there aren't particular ways that like I use, you know, somatics in my practice, which is, you know, technique based. I use um, something akin to internal family systems, like dialogue between different parts of a person. But, but all of it is imbued with those three conditions. Well, there's a way in which you could say that means, I see that you're Buddha. I see that you're Buddha. And for me to see that you're Buddha, I have to be Buddha too. Right? I trust myself. I trust... I, I've done a lot of work. I can see what's arising in myself. I trust it. I'm not scared of it. And I see you, and I'm not scared of you. And I see your blocks. And even your blocks and the way that you grind yourself down does not scare me. Sometimes it makes me sad. But it doesn't scare me, and I see that it's actually a way you're using to try to help and protect yourself. Do you need to do that right here, today? Do you need to protect yourself? Yeah, I don't have a more tricky answer than that, except that um, it's a little bit like you're doing meditation for the other person. Because w meditation just means trust your experience. 100% trust and don't judge your experience. And even if you judge your experience, understand that, that, that the judgment itself is just more experience. It's not actually a judge. It's just, oh, here's a judgment. And you watch that in yourself, and all the time you just see it. Oh, that's Buddha, that's Buddha, that's Buddha, that's Buddha, that's Buddha. And then, because you don't fight it, it goes down, it goes down, it goes down, it goes down. Okay. Karma goes, starts to go down, our habitual Karma is just another way of saying habitual thought, uh, habit, habits of mind and action, right? So our habits go down, our habitual, and we become free because our habits of telling ourselves we shouldn't act this way and we should act that way, that karma goes down, 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 we can become free, right? So basically, we provide ourselves with unconditional positive regard, empathy, and congruence, right? So in our meditation practice. So something similar with, with that, but that's not a quick fix. I mean, I don't feel like, I feel like I happen to be able to talk in general about one way of relating our practice to how I work with clients. But pathologizing, pathologizing people who we're trying to help can actually reinforce the things we're trying to help them with. I mean, 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 meaning it can reinforce the problem, right? When we see, if I see you as a problem, then you continue to think the world sees you as a problem. If I see you as Buddha, then you have a chance to experiment with your speech and your behavior differently with me, and then maybe be a little bit more free with me, and then maybe you can be more free elsewhere. Yeah. Whoever might be considering assisted death, whoever that person uh, uh, might be, if they were in my life, I would point them very strongly towards professional help because it's, without judgment, it's a big decision. There may be uh, a healthy impulse to end one's life at some stage, there may be, um, but uh, the impulse to end one's life is also can be the natural result of depression or anxiety or something like that. It's not that I am saying that that person is necessarily wrong, but a big investigation is required. Is there ever an incident or a possibility where death is not wrong? I don't, I don't know. What, what is death? What is death? Death. Yeah. What if I ask for a demonstration? Don't know. Yeah. You ask me. What is death? So I hit. You say only that. Only that. 
that's as much as I know. Who knows if death is good? We, there, who knows whether death is good or bad? But there is, in general, m m people experience a vital force that wants, that wants them to stay alive. Mm -hmm. And people that love us have a loving force that want us to stay alive. Whether death is good or bad or not is not part of the thing. The question is, regardless of whether what death is, what we do know is that there is a vital force that actually wants us to stay alive, and there is a love force from others that also wants us to stay alive. So sometimes things like depression or anxiety can betray that vital force. The vital force is true, right? Whatever death means, whether death is good or bad, there's still a vital force inside us that says, let's stay alive as long as we can, right? And if something says, no, let's not, there's a chance that something is wrong. It doesn't mean death is good or death is bad. It means that something is undermining that vital force that's natural inside most of us, right? Also, that there's not only just us ourselves to consider too, there's the love force of the people around us that ending our lives can betray. That means that this is a very, very serious decision and sometimes the person making that kind of a decision isn't in the position to make it. It's so serious that it really has to be examined. I'm in long-term recovery from alcoholism and addiction, and I go to AA, and there's a joke that I just can't remember, but it's something like, I was in such a bad mood when I was hungry. Should you kill yourself, or should you just have a cheeseburger? So, something, something like that. I don't need cheeseburger, but, 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 but the point is, if you do kill yourself in that moment, you're killing the wrong person, right? You're killing a person that's not actually, you're killing the core, for something that at the outside's not right, right? So, so in assisted, assisted death, you have to make sure that actually uh, everything's in place and all of that, you know. What about for the terminally ill patients? Yeah, what about them? Is it a different situation for them? Can First of all, you ask me, is life, is death bad, right? But then you just said to me, they could end their life early and avoid suffering. I ask you, is suffering bad? Mm -hmm. hmm. So it's still a tricky question, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's still a question that needs to be examined very carefully. To the extent, to, you know, in, if it was in my life, to the extent that I am in relation to it and have responsibility for it. As an abstract question, it's, well, in a sense, not that interested in abstract questions. Perhaps you could share your little story. About my mom? You and your mom, India. Actually, it's so funny. I, did, I shared this story here in Kyoche when I was a uh, uh, head Dharma teacher. And there was a Korean monk here, a young Korean monk whose name I forget, but... He was, he was very moved by this story I'm about to tell you. It doesn't mean that you're going to be very moved. Um, and he went back to Korea and he wrote me a letter and sent me a calligraphy by his teacher. It means undermined, undermined, which is, uh, uh, it can mean humble, but it also could mean don't know, before mind. Yeah, yeah. When my mom was dying, I was staying there, I was, and she, she took her about 12, 12, from the time we knew she was sick to the time she died, it was about 12 weeks. And there was lots of conversations, and she, by the way, she, uh, at a certain stage, the social worker in the hospice called me into her office, he said, Colin, I need to talk to you. I said, what's up? She said, well, I asked your mom uh, what religion she is. I was like, oh, what'd she say? She said, she said Buddhist. I was like... <laughs> Oh, that's news to me. <laughs> she said, so I said to her, Judy, I, I don't know any like Buddhist priests or even whatever you call them. I, you know, I know some rabbis and some priests and some ministers, but yeah, who, who, so 
who do you know who's Buddhist who you want to be your chaplain through this process? So my mother said, my son. <laughs> so the social worker was like, kind of like, over to you. So uh, I don't know if it's really recommended that you be chaplain to your mother when she's dying, but, but I was. In truth, I was. And so one day she said, I was going back to the house, do you need anything? Yeah, bring me my jewelry. She, she didn't have any precious jewelry or anything. It was just like bits and pieces that she'd put together. Anyway, so, you know, I was rushing around and I left the house and I was driving back to the hospice where she was and I realized I'd forgotten the jewelry. I was like, ugh. I was like, what does it matter? Like, what does she need her jewelry for? Who cares? It's like, she's not going out dancing, you know what I mean? So who cares? And then I said, then I thought to myself, just go get it because she asked. So I turned around and I drove back and I got the jewelry. It was like a lot, it was a lot of pieces. And she went through the jewelry piece by piece. Oh, your sister gave me this. I remember piece by piece, it took like three hours. The jewelry became some sort of way for her to review her whole life. And she told, give this to Bella, give this to me. There wasn't that much really to give away. Anyway, what I learned from that is like, it's not my job to decide what's important for other people. Like I, I thought, who does it matter whether I bring that stupid jewelry to the hospital? This is, it's not my job to decide. Earlier in my life, in a relationship with a woman named Lucy, who I really loved, and her mother was dying and she hated her mother. I said to her, you know, what do you need me to do? What do you need me to do? She said, I brought this, this was in, we were living in the UK. I bought this belt at Marks and Spencer. I decided I don't like it, could you take it back? And I was just like, like it just went right in the ear, in one ear, and I was just like, that's ridiculous. Like, you know, that's, that's got nothing to do with this situation, you don't need that. Anyway, she was so hurt that I didn't take that belt back. I just, I just, because I just decided she didn't really need me to. <laughs> right? She, that wasn't important under the circumstances. There's one story about my mom dying. <laughs> but another, an aspect of helping my mom to die and, and also in my work, I, I'm not scared of suffering. I was able to be with my mom because I wasn't scared of her suffering. I wasn't scared. She, well, you know, when she was scared, I, I, I hear you, Mom. I, yeah, it's scary. That's a sc it's scary. It's the biggest, scariest thing. And she said, I guess I just have to let go. I said, that, that probably sounds right. I didn't tell her, but she, that's the conclusion she came to. It's not that I didn't have empathy and compassion and, and wish that she wasn't suffering. I just wasn't scared of it because I didn't know if it was good or bad. And similarly, I didn't know if her dying would be good or bad. Actually, there's a Zen story that I wanted to tell you guys anyway that I'm going to tell you that fits us. Somehow there's no rules or ways of being that fit these situations. There's only, can I trust myself moment to moment to moment, right? And to trust myself means come here, not in my thoughts and my preconceptions and my ideas and my habits. I mean, really come here. And here means eyes, ears, nose, tongue, touch, objects of mind, but it's also some sort of intuition rises up, right, that comes from, uh, fr that is the whole world, you know. So um, everybody remember this uh, Guji, One Finger Zen? Everybody knows about, anybody never heard of Guji, One Finger Zen? Okay, so <clears throat> if you remember, um, uh, at the end of the story of Guji, he says, all my life I used the one finger Zen of old troll, troll young and never exhausted it, and then he croaked. <laughs> anyway, I was reading today and um, in um, Robert Eichen's book about the Mumin Kwan, and he was writing about the Guji Koan, but he said that the story of Guji getting one finger Zen, so Guji um, was practicing in a hermitage by himself. Um, and um, uh, 
uh, a nun came. Her name was True World. A nun came in, 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 in Chinese, I guess. Um, anyway, uh, she didn't knock on the door or anything. She just burst in the door. She walked in, and she walked around him three times. Now, apparently, to walk around somebody three times was a traditional form of greeting, but at the end, you're supposed to then bow, right? Three times, full prostration. But she walked in, she burst in, she walked around him three times, and she was wearing her hat. She said, if you can give me one appropriate word, I'll take my hat off. Meaning, if you give me an appropriate word, I'll take my hat off and I'll bow. Guji said, he'd been practicing for a really long time in the hermitage by himself, by himself, by the way, in the hermitage, out of relationship with the rest of the world. So, so, um, so then she bursts in and um, he couldn't say anything. So she walks around him three times again. And she stopped. She said, if you can give me one appropriate word, I'll take my hat off. He still couldn't say anything. So she walks around him three times again. Again, if you can give me an appropriate word, I'll take my hat off. And, um, uh, uh, but he still is stuck, right? So she goes to leave. And he, he looks, and it's getting dark out. He said, it's, it's getting dark out. Like, it's dangerous. Really, you should stay the night. So she said, if you can give me one appropriate word, I'll stay the night. But he was stuck, so she left. So Goji says, Jesus, I've been sitting in this hermitage all this time practicing, and I don't know how to deal with a nun who comes and walks around me three times. I can't think of an appropriate word. So much so that when the nun says, I'm going to go off in the dark in the danger, and all she wants to say is an appropriate word. I can't think of an appropriate word. So he packs up all his things, and he, he, he's going to go. He's decided he's going to go into the world and find the teacher. Anyway, he's packed up all his things, and he's sitting with his pack, right, waiting for the sun to come up. Um, and then he's going to leave. And he's kind of like sitting on his, you know, kind of dozing like this. And as he's dozing, the mountain spirit comes to him. He says, don't leave right now. A great teacher is going to come to you. So he unpacks his bag, and he waits a couple of days. And then Chol Young shows up, great Zen master. And he tells this whole story of what happened to the nun and how he doesn't feel like he's attained anything. And then uh, he gets to the end of the story, and Chorion goes, and Guji gets enlightenment. <laughs> Which is really interesting, because if you're in a hermitage in the middle of the woods and somebody shows up, probably they've traveled a really long distance. You know, and it's no problem to if you trust this vitality that's inside you, right? It's no problem to know what to do when someone arrives, right? No problem. Last Kilche, winter Kilche, I was doing interviews. I rang the bell, the door opens, and this guy goes, ah! <laughs> I said, have a seat. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> so if we're not careful, there's something that can stop us. Right? Fortunately for Guji, even though his, he wasn't in touch with his vitality at the moment when the nun was running circles around him, at the moment when he was falling asleep, something deep inside him said, your teacher's coming, wait. And fortunately, at that point, he did trust himself, right? Mm -hmm. That means don't be scared of yourself. This is all these ideas like, don't do this, don't do that, do this, do this. If you do this, you'll get that. Because we're scared of just this. So there's another story. Speaking of what we're scared of, this is another. I've been saying, talking about this a lot lately. So. 
This is a 46th case in the, in the Mumin Kwan. It's called One More Step from the Pole Top. Master Soksong said, how do you take one more step from the top of a 100-foot pole? Also, an ancient master said, even if one is sitting on the top of a 100-foot pole, one has yet, not yet attained the truth. You must take one more step. Then your original body appears in the ten directions. And the poem is, keen eyes made blind, misunderstand scale markings, give up body and life, one blind me leading many blind. So this, this kangan is kind of funny because it's in reverse order, like, because he says, how do you take one step off a hundred foot pole? And then they tell you what he's referring to. So an ancient master said, even if you're sitting on top of a hundred foot pole, you have to take one more step. Um, and then Master Soksong said, well, how do you take one more step off the top of a hundred foot pole? But a hundred foot pole, it's very hard to get to the top of a hundred foot pole, right? That's like, oh, oh, this is very blissful and peaceful. I worked very hard to get here, but finally I'm here. Or, or oh, I have some idea about how to live. I worked very hard to figure out how to work with clients. And now I'm here, you know, I have an idea uh, or, you know, uh, I, I have some idea, um, and then we cling to the idea, like, oh, I'm a great hermit in the woods, Guji, and I, I have wonderful ideas, and now there's a nun here. What do my wonderful ideas tell me about how to deal with the nun? <laughs> oh, God, they don't have any, I got no direction from all that practice. It doesn't tell me, but he knew. Right? So we, I think, I think especially as senior practitioners, have to be careful because we can decide that we're going to grab onto some way of being, you know? And, and, and one, even as, so one time I had an experience here, Matt Keeler, Jita Pope's name, is teaching. It was before I was a Jita Pope's name. And I had some experience where um, I talked to him about it. I described it as, there was no space between something happening and me experiencing it happening. That's all I can say. It was very bright and immediate. And it stayed for like an hour, and then it went away. And still to this day, I sometimes think, I want that again. <laughs> That's not stepping from a 100-foot pole. Right? Yeah, there's nothing to be scared of. There's nothing wrong with this. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong. There's, that doesn't mean it doesn't hurt or we don't suffer. It just means there's nothing wrong. When we can put down our ideas and our concepts and our habits and just return over and over, then we have everything. And because we have everything, we're able to be generous, we're able to be patient, we're able to be absorbed. All the paramitas just appear by themselves. And that doesn't just mean that, uh, that w w we serve the world, it means that the world also serves us because we're not separate, right? These qualities appear in us and they, uh, uh, Zen Master Jokab, Ken Kessel once said, he read somewhere something about the scent of the paramitas appear. It means not just that the paramitas appear in me, but they appear in the world. So the world becomes generous. The world becomes patient. Our life, our, we begin to experience our lives differently. We begin to see that we and all beings are already Buddha. Even if you don't ask me a question, I can go on. <laughs>